Hello everybody, my name is Liam Wolken and today we will be showing you how to go about converting your typical tub surround bathroom like this one here into something a little bit more modern with a full walk-in shower. The first thing we're going to do here is start some prep work. So here we have a floor register. We're just going to stuff a couple rags in there and put the existing register back on. We want to keep the HVAC system clear of any debris and dust. We also want to protect all the flooring. So from your means of entry to the project space, we will put down some RAM board and drop sheets utilizing both. Uh, note with the blue painter's tape on hardwood flooring, you just want to be really cautious. This does have the ability to pull up finishing. So maybe put a little test piece down, ensure your floors were done correctly. And with any of these projects, we do require use of a bedroom close by so that we can store the many tools and materials required for this project. Very common with these types of bathrooms is to have no ceiling lighting and just relying on an older wall sconce. So a lot of these you'll find are installed with a couple screws on the top side, maybe a couple on the bottom. So you can take a Phillips screwdriver, loosen that faceplate there, revealing the wires from beneath. We want to make sure power's off, and we're going to verify that with a non-contact -vo voltage tester. Once we know power's off, we can remove the wing nuts here. And then the back plate of this fixture just has a couple screws going in the wall. You may or may not have an octagon box behind this fixture. Uh, oftentimes, the builders seem to have just skipped that step. No worries. And then we're going to tie on one of these temporary pigtails with the, a nice bright LED light in there. And it's going to help us see th throughout the duration of this project. You will then want to shut water off to the house and drain the lines using the lowest possible faucets at your disposal. And then you can see here, we just take the shot back, remove the filter and suck out both the bowl and the tank to get rid of any leftover water. And then your toilet will have these two nuts on either side that are holding it down to the floor. So you just want to go ahead and take those off. And in this case here, you can see that this one was seized on there. So we just went ahead and took a sawzall with a fine tooth blade to cut the bolt and get access to removing this toilet. Uh, the old water line will still have some leftover water, so you just want to get a rag below that to catch it, and then you can take that off. And with that, uh, some of these toilets, not all the time, but some will be caulked to the floor as well, so you can take a knife and cut that if that is the case. And then you can go ahead and just lift up on the toilet, and it should just break free. And you can go ahead and remove this. You can then take a little bit of a putty knife here, just a cheap one, as throw it away after, and just remove the wax seal and leftover uh disgustingness and then stuff a rag in the flange there that's going to stop any sewer gas from coming back up as you're working this is the sink drain below the vanity and we do want to disconnect all the plumbing now from the countertop there so we're going to start by just loosening a couple of these nuts getting the trap out yours may not have that capability in which case you'll have to cut it out which you'll see us doing anyways here so where it comes out of the wall we're just going to cut that with a fine tooth blade on the sawzall and then put a cap on it to stop any sewer gas from coming out our water lines here did not have shutoffs, and so we're going to cut them out. Although even if yours did have shutoffs, I'd still recommend cutting them and replacing them. Anyways, here's a better look at how you go about doing that. So you want to start with just a pipe cutter, go around your copper line here until it comes off, and then kind of take that excussion plate off if there is one, and take some emery cloth and just clean it up. Get rid of all that old nastiness there. And then you can take a deburring tool and go and ream both the in and outside of that copper line, getting rid of any sharp edges. And then here we're just taking a shark bite depth setter so we just kind of put that tool on put a sharpie mark and then that's just a shark bite end cap you could pick up that will temporarily cap those water lines typically a vanity will be held in with just a couple of screws going into the wall so you can see here at the top those are just going into the framing behind and while we're at it we're going to go ahead and just remove the sink to get access to one of those screws and after that, you may or may not just have a caulk joint along the top of it that you can cut with a knife. And with that, your vanity should just come right out. You just want to be careful, mindful of those water lines that may be coming through some small holes as you lift this thing out and get rid of it. This is a very common style of builder grade fixture here, and it's just held on with adhesive. So we just want to score all the way around it and then kind of shimmy it out of place. And it will take off some of the drywall paper there. You can't really get around that. Um, so just make sure you're scoring it and then later on you will have some drywall work to repair with these once we're it's a very common style of larger mirror and they typically just have a couple brackets on the bottom and top so the top two brackets we just want to push up and then with that we can kind of take the top of the mirror and slowly start prying it off of the wall it will be held with adhesive so you just want to go very slow you can tape it up for safety and just slowly pry it away from that wall there 
To remove the shower head, you're just going to rotate it in the counterclockwise direction. Very simple. And you can do the same with the shower arm. In this bathroom here, this one was seized in there completely, but that's of no worry. We can just leave it. And then with the shower valve, this one here, we pop off that middle tab, releasing the screw from underneath. And then the faceplate is held in with another couple screws. So we'll get those out and then break the seal of silicone that's holding this thing against the tile. The tub spout here just has a small Allen key underneath it. So we're just going to go ahead, loosen that, and then pull this thing off. Then we can unscrew the overflow here. It's typically just a screw or two holding it in. And then the drain, you just can take a couple of screwdrivers here and kind of put them in an X and just rotate them against each other counterclockwise direction to get that, that drain out of there. To minimize the amount of work in removing the tile from the tub surround here, we're taking a multi-tool here and a vacuum to reduce the amount of dust. We're just going to score right along that tile where it meets the drywall. This way we can actually pull off the tile and backer board in large chunks and it's going to be a lot cleaner that way. So once we have those two walls scored, we can then take a knife and go around, cut all of the silicone in the corners of this thing. You just really want to score it all up. And with that, you can take a pry bar or a hammer and start removing all of this tile. Here we have a tiled ceiling. So we are starting with the ceiling just for safety reasons. And we're just going to score kind of a line in it with the hammer, just, just making a nice line. That way we can get our hands above it right on the backer board itself. And you just want to start slowly kind of pulling up and down. And if it's just drywall, which oftentimes it is with these older style bathrooms, you can really easily pull it loose from its fasteners. Um, it may have a cement board backer, in which case it won't be as easy, but still with the right amount of, of smashing and, and pulling, rocking it back and forth, you can get these out in nice big chunks like you're seeing here. The final thing will typically just be some fasteners along the tub flange there. So you can either pry these out or as you are seeing here, just take a sawzall and go ahead and cut them. And with all of those gone, you can then just lift the tub out. You want to kind of lift up, get it at an angle, and it should just come right on out. And then very similar with what you saw under the vanity there, we're just going to cut these copper lines here and then cap them temporarily with those shark bite end caps we used previously. Uh, eventually, we will rework all of the plumbing, of course. But for now, we want to be able to get water back on at the end of the demo day. So just by having these caps in place, we're going to be able to do that. To remove the baseboard and trim, you can just score along where it meets the wall to cut the caulking and then take a glazing bar or drywall knife, anything skinny and flat really, and just kind of pry it away, get those brad nails released from the wall. And typically um, it will be pretty cheap stuff in a builder grade bathroom, so it will fall apart as you do this. Uh, look, you can make a case for reusing stuff, but I think if you're going to all this trouble, you're better off buying new, having a nice fresh bathroom. And then here you can see we're just removing the floor. So all we're using here is a three foot pry bar. Uh, the type of installation that they used here was a lath underlayment. So that's that metal chicken wire kind of stuff you could see. So we just want to take the pry bar and get both underneath the tile and underneath that lath and then just pull up, pull up a section tile by tile, you know, small increments. It may or may not be really bad. Depends on the previous installer. And with a lath style installation, you will have these staples. So we're just taking some side cutters here and just prying them all up one by one. Uh, get rid of these bad boys. A really another common feature with these style bathrooms is this dropped ceiling area. So typically I would go up into the attic and just remove all this blown insulation from above the space. However, here in this day, I did not have my attic suit and this is fiberglass insulation. So I didn't want to become all itchy deal with that so instead we just cut the vapor barrier and let this all fall down and then we bagged it in garbage bags and then just threw it right back up to the ceiling so later on once i go back up there when the ceiling's repaired i can just use that same insulation to re-insulate above this space and then getting rid of the framing from this dropped section here so you just take a sawzall and and kind of cut the fasteners on one end of those two by fours and once you have that, you should be able to pry the leftover pieces out. Combination of the fine tooth blade and the wood blade. You know, as you saw there, we just cut the wood in half and then cut the fasteners on the top piece there. And then you can just pull these pieces right on out. And then sometimes you'll have kind of this plywood on the one side. So you can just take a pry bar or a hammer, get rid of everything. What our goal here is just no remains, no remains from this dropped area because we want a nice flush ceiling after this. 
you can then take a knife and just kind of cut this in a straight line that way when you go to put new vapor barrier up you can just have one straight joint of tape to repair it and get rid of this ugly mess and speaking of which you can just take some staples and if your your vapor barrier is pulled off you can either replace it with new vapor barrier or just staple the old and repair it with tuck tape that's that red tape there now as we are converting this from a tub surround to a walk-in shower we do have to rework the plumbing and to do that we are going to have to open up the subfloor now Typically, you wouldn't have to open up the entire shower area as we are doing here. However, in this bathroom, we are doing a curbless shower, which means we will have to open everything up. So to do so, we are using a skill saw for that one straight rip. And then along the edges, we just have a sawzall with a wood blade. And we're just going to cut at a shallow depth. You don't want to go too deep during this as there could be mechanical items underneath that you do not want to cut into. So we're just going to score all along the perimeter along that front edge at the depth of what we are planning to have our shower size. And then we can even do a few more rips to just break this large chunk of subfloor into multiple pieces and just pry it all up. Now we do have to rework the drain and a little bit of the vent here. So we're going to start by just cutting off where the drain extends out from that, that vent line there. And then after that, we can go ahead and actually cut both where the drain ties into the stack as well as the top, the vent side, because we do need to rework this, this whole pipe so that's in that stud space there. Uh, they had this ran previously outside of the stud space because there was a tub here, obviously, so they could get away with it, but that's not going to work for our application. So we're just going to cut both ends here and then start coming up with a plan on how to rerun this. So the first step is we do need to make a hole to get a new pipe into this stud cavity. So here I do have a right angle drill. You don't need this, however, because we do this so often, we have some tools that you may not have, but again, you can get away without something like that. And then here we're gonna come off with a Y that's gonna go to our drain and then also a couple of 90s to go and tie into the existing vent there. And we just wanna dry fit everything. Then we can drill out the holes to get the drain to the center of the shower area. And when we drill those holes, we want to try to stay somewhere in the center of the joists. And also we do want to have the appropriate slope on this drain. So we want that drain to be at a slight downwards angle. And with this, we are using inch and a half code in your area may require two inch for us. We're using inch and a half here. And once we have a dry fit, we know that things will kind of fall into place. We can go ahead and glue things up. In our case, we are working with ABS, so we're using the ABS cement. We put some around both the pipe and with the inner sides of the fittings, push it in, give it a little twist, make sure you have full coverage. And then to get to this drain here, we are using a long sweep 90 as this drain is a horizontal line. So we want to use that long sweep 90. Then we're going to come off. We marked the center of where our trap should be with an X on the floor. I'm going to come off with another piece of pipe and then put a fixed trap right down here, making sure that our trap is level and that the center lands on that X. I can then go ahead and tie in the vent here. So I'm just going to glue that up and then there is enough play above in the attic so that I can push that top side up a bit so that I can get a coupling on and tie these two pieces together. Since we do have to rework all of the plumbing and electrical in this vanity side wall, we're just going to go ahead and open up the majority of the bottom half of this wall. So we mark at 48 and a half inches off the floor. This way we can just cut a nice line and later on just put an entire full sheet of drywall there. Uh, it's going to make for the easiest repair and give us a ton of access. The drain here did have to be reworked as it did not come off in the center of our vanity. If we had left it, it would have ended up in a drawer space, which wouldn't have worked. So we did have to cut it and rework it, get it over to the left more. So we're just going to cut it, come off with a long sweep 90 and stub out in the center of our new vanity space. And you will notice the drain ran along the top of the subfloor here. Fortunately for us, you, this is something you'd have to double check, but the type of vanity we had would easily fit right over that and cover the entirety of it. There's no exposed underneath for this vanity. So we could just leave this without having to open up the subfloor and rework more plumbing here. Now this is a, you know, a reno, so we can't do a typical pressure test uh, to test these drains. However, what we do have here is just a makeshift little system. We adapted to two inch and just took a bucket of water. We run it down that drain and make sure there's no water coming out of any of the fittings. With that, you can start thinking about your water lines and plumbing fixtures, and this is going to be the blocking that we're putting in for all of our shower fixtures. Now, this is a very common occurrence to run into in which there is a stud mounted right in the center of your wall. And for us, it's very important to note that this is a non-load-bearing wall. 
meaning that this stud has no integrity to the structure of the house. So we're go good to go ahead and notch it as you're seeing here. Now, if that wasn't the case for you, you could go ahead and rework your wall. So you could maybe remove this stud, put in a couple more spaced apart so that you have enough room to mount your shower valve and whatever else you may need. However, for us, that was going to be a lot of work. There's plumbing ran through this, electrical ran through it. So it's non-load bearing, so we can just notch it as you're seeing here. It's more to note with shower valves, a lot of them, it will be the case that if you just take a two by four and a two by four framed wall and put it flat against that backing, as you can kind of see there, that will give you the correct depth of which to mount your shower valve to. But it's very important to double check this with your shower valve as they can be different. So just make sure you look over your instructions to find what depth to mount your shower valve. This long piece of blocking we're installing now, we're having at the front side of that two by four cavity. And this is gonna be for our handheld uh, adjustable bar. So this uh, shower system here has a long adjustable bar. So we want some wood blocking behind the wall so that we can screw into something solid later on. And then just below it, we're gonna mount another two by four, but this one is gonna be at the back side of the cavity. And this we're gonna mount a drop ear onto in just a bit, which you will see. And that's what's gonna give us our water supply line for our shower fixture. And then very similar concept at the top here, this will be for our rain head. It's just a piece of wood blocking that will support a drop ear later on, which again, you will see. This here is our shower valve, and we're just gonna go ahead and adapt it to PEX, as that is the type of piping we will be using for this installation. So we're gonna start by putting on three to four revolutions of Teflon per fitting, and then some pipe dope as well. And this is just a male thread adapter. So we're just gonna screw it into the shower valve and make sure it's nice and tight with some channel locks there. This is the drop ear I had mentioned that has the PEX fitting on it. And this is just three screws and we're just gonna put that right into that piece of blocking we had installed for it on the right hand side, just about torso level here. That way uh, with this particular style, it does have an adjustable bar. So we do have a large range of play height wise for where this can go. And then installing the shower valve, we're using a laser to make sure it's perfectly level. And then just a couple of screws to hold this thing into the wall there. We're then going to take a spade bit, a one inch spade bit, and make two holes in each stud all the way from where those existing copper lines are on the left over to the vanity as we're not only going to be refeeding the shower system, but we're also going to tee off, feed the toilet and the vanity with our new PEX lines as well. And then we can go ahead and adapt these copper lines into PEX. So we're going to cut them a little bit lower. And as you can see here, this is the sweat adapter. And we're going to take a wire brush and just rough up the inside of that piece there. That way the solder has a place to uh, sit and fill once we go ahead and adapt it. And then on top of that, we're going to take some flux. It comes with a little brush. So we just want to fill that fitting with flux. We're also going to hit the end side of the copper with flux as well. We can then take those little fittings there and place them over top of our copper. Very similar as you saw earlier, in order to clean up the copper, we're going to take an emery cloth, clean, sand the outside of it, and then deburr both the in and outside of those copper lines. Typically when we solder, we would use a flame retardant cloth. Uh, we had lost ours, of course, right prior to doing this. So instead we just took an old piece of tile, stuck it back there, and then heated up both the copper line here and the fitting and then went in with some solder and just filled that completely. And it is important to know anytime you're doing anything related to water lines, you do want to eventually pressurize the system and check for leaks. Uh, this job specifically, we did actually have a pinhole leak once water was on at one of those sweat adapted fittings. So it's really important to, to pressurize the lines and, and check over all of your work here. And down here, you can see we're just capping off these copper lines as they were just feeding the toilet and vanity before, which we're going to rework so we can just cap those in the stud space. And then we let those connections cool down naturally. Uh, and once they've cooled down a bit, we can start running our pecs. So here, of course, blue for cold, red for hot. And we're using the crimp rings here for all of our connections. So you can just get these rings, a the nice crimp tool, and just make sure with each fitting you do, you're crimping those down. And you do want to see a little bit of that PEX after the ring, quarter inch, eighth inch or so. Um, and then we're going to stub out with PEX for all of our water lines here. Uh, you could, of course, stub out with copper. I know some people prefer that, but we're just using uh, a little system here, a bracket and that purple ring and kind of tighten it to make it all firm. 
and same thing on the hot side as you just saw with the cold side we're going to come up get these pex cutters that you can purchase and then put all of our fittings into place run it over to the right so that we can go ahead and feed the vanity And once again, stubbing out with the pecs, and in hindsight, we should have stubbed these out a little bit higher above that train, as, as they were just a little too close for my liking. Uh, I did later create a bit of a uh, drywall break, as the holes were too close together, so just something to improve upon for next time. And on that hotline, we're just going to put a shark bite end cap. On the cold line, a temporary shutoff. That way, we do have working water in this project space to fill any of our buckets that we might need. Then coming off of the shower valve here, both are cold and hot line, and you will see that little piece of copper sticking out from the pecs. That is what is called a hammer arrestor, and we like to put those in with every job just below the shower valve. That way, with any sudden change of pressure, the water has a place to go to, and it will stop and reduce any hammering of your pipes and just kind of increase the longevity of your system here. And with all of our supply lines done, we can then just go ahead and feed the handheld and rain head. So similar concept to everything else. We're just going to take some pecs, crimp it onto both the shower valve and the drop ears that we had installed previously. And once we have that all crimped in, another thing we want to do is actually uh, stop those drop ears. So we're just going to take a brass nipple. I think we have maybe a five inch brass nipple that we just thread into that drop ear with a the same half inch sized end cap on it. And that way, once we pressurize the lines, there's not going to be water shooting out from those fittings. And then anytime you've run water lines, drains, uh, you do want to put protection plates over everything. And here's just a brief look into the future to kind of show you what we did, go over it. So we came up with those supply lines, went to the hammer arresters, fed the valve, went down to the drop ear, which is just below that blocking. Same thing, a drop ear at the top for our rain head. And you can see those brass nipples in the drop ears. We're going to T over cold line extends out of the wall for our toilet and then straight up to the vanity and here is how we went about recessing the shower floor so we are doing a curbless shower as we had mentioned so a part of doing this is to recess the entirety of the subfloor in the shower area reason being is that to have a properly working shower we need to have slope from the entire perimeter of the shower area to the drain which means that the edge of the shower pan uh, will be higher than that of the drain location. So to avoid building up the entire bathroom floor to account for that slope, we want to recess the area within the shower. And this is going to create a really clean transition from the bathroom and from the hallway into the shower. So all we're doing here is mounting some two by fours at a depth of three quarter inch. We take some construction adhesive and framing nails and just mount these two by fours into the sides of the existing joist. And you can see we have a little test strip of plywood. That way we can ensure that when we put the plywood on top of the newly installed two by fours, the top of that plywood is going to be flush with the top of the existing joist. And we're going to do this for every single joist in this shower stall. I also want to call to attention, you can see that green insulation there that is safe and sound. So it's a good idea. You can put some of this around your drains to reduce any noise from below. Now, the next step here is we do have these cut pieces of plywood that we're going to just mount in between the joists and on top of our sister two by fours. We're going to put that down with construction adhesive once again and flooring screws. And we have this piece cut longer than the actual space. That way you can kind of see we slide it underneath the existing subfloor and on the opposite side underneath that bottom plate of the wall. That way we can bond everything together and have it really strong. Now, unfortunately, on this side, the other joist was way too far underneath uh, that wall space there, so we couldn't fasten anything to it. So instead, what we're doing here is we're going to take some carriage bolts and tie this 2x6 into the bottom plate of our wall. We're going to use a combination of construction adhesive carriage bolts and number 12 wood screws to fully anchor this piece to that bottom plate and have it well supported and that's what's going to hold our subfloor now also to know is i did mess up here i needed to space that two by six another three quarters of an inch so i did have to loosen all these fasteners uh take a piece of uh, two uh three quarter inch plywood and space that further down uh, but then you can see we kind of get another piece of two by four here blocking and put it on the framing below just to help support that piece even more so 
Something else I want to call attention to is the vent there on the back corner. You can see that 90, it is eventually going to stick up past our new subfloor. And this was as expected. Uh, it was the lowest we could get it without completely cutting open the ceiling below and reworking all of the plumbing here. Uh, so the reason why we could do this and have it extend just a little bit past the subfloor is our shower pan is going to be more than an inch thick. So just by notching a little section of our shower pan, just half an inch, we are going to be able to fully embed that vent there beneath our shower pan and not have it be an issue. In this wall here, we will be inserting a niche eventually. So for the time being, we're not going to frame it out for the exact niche size. What I like to do with these situations is just create an opening much larger than what we will need. That way, once we have a first wall of tile installed, we can put the niche to correspond with the grout line and it's going to look really clean that way and actually make for an easier time of tiling. So this again is a non-load bearing wall. So I can just kind of chotch that stud out there, nice big section of it, and then just put a couple of pieces of wood on the top and bottom for our backing board, which will go in shortly. The current bathroom only had two switches, but we want four. We want to switch for the pot lights, the wall sconces, the exhaust fan, and a towel warmer. So we're going to have to remove the existing two gang box here and add a four gang box. So to do this, we're going to first cut out a hole that will house the four gang. And then we're going to go ahead, label the wires and shut power off. So you want to hit the circuit breaker that's feeding this bathroom. And then we can kind of pry that box away from the stud on the left there and just get all our wires out. And this will enable us to bring new wires down and rework the current electrical system here. You do want to install a couple pieces of wood blocking above the old drywall. That way, when you put the new piece in, you can screw them together and that will help prevent any cracking in the future. We are going to replace the existing exhaust fan as well. And to do this, we are installing the Panasonic Whisper fan. And with a nice, very sleek, this is the fit exhaust fan cover, the flush mount. So it's going to get mudded in and it's going to look really clean. All we're going to do is take four self-drilling screws, put that kind of cover and screw it to the edge, the metal edge of that fan there. And then now we can remove the current fan. It's just fastened into that joist there on the side and then cut out a new location for our fan. So to do this, we're just going to take the sizing of the fits cover there and cut out a hole adequate to be able to fit this thing up there. And we just want to make sure that hole we cut out is square with the room. We're then going to install some wood blocking all around the perimeter of this opening. That way, when we go and push the new fan up, we have something to screw it into. And as you can see, you just kind of put it up. I'm up in the attic, hooking up the electrical and ductwork while Sebastian is down here. And he can just fasten those edges up into the blocking he previously put in there. And while I'm up there, I'm going to rework a lot of the electrical. So Sebastian is going to hand me pieces of wire and I'll just take them and I'll run them down the wall to feed the switches here. So you can see I'm up above and I'm just shoving that wire down a hole in the top plate of the framing. Sebastian will grab it. He'll label what it is and then I'll put it to the other end where it needs to go. So in this case, for example, can feed the fan, tie it together. So black to black, white to white, ground to ground, make the connections, close up this box. And you can also see the insulated duct that I did connect to the exhaust fan as well. I would strongly recommend picking up one of these Tyvek suits if you need to go in an attic as when it has insulation like this, it can be very itchy. And here's just a look at that duct work connected to the fan. And then you can kind of see where the electrical wire will eventually get ran and down that wall there. And we're just going to do the same thing for various locations. So this one here, we're going to run a new wire to feed the wall sconces. And when it comes to wall sconces, I do like to just leave the wire coiled up in the stud cavity and we cut it out once the mirror is in place that we can perfectly center those boxes and a wire here. This is an 18 to a low voltage cable. This will feed. We're going to have some niche lighting going in. So for now, we're just going to run this wire down, leave it in the niche space and the other end of the wire will go down to the vanity where eventually a driver will power it up. I'll eventually release a full in-depth video on this process if you are interested in learning how to add accent lighting to a niche. Anyways, once all the electrical is ran, uh, we're pretty much done with the attic access. So Sebastian is going to put up some vapor barrier here. He's going to staple it into place and then use tuck tape to seal it to the existing vapor barrier everywhere. And once he has that up, I'm still in the attic. I can kind of re-insulate above this space, make sure we have full coverage of insulation throughout the ceiling here. And then we can come down and we're done with the attic access. 
This is an option you can consider doing yourself, although it's absolutely not necessary. This is uh, Rockwell's safe and sound, sound dampening insulation. So it's very itchy to work with. So I would suggest wearing a suit if you're gonna be working with it in a respirator, of course. I'm just gonna cut it to size to fill all these cavities. Uh, you know, since we have walls open, it's a nice little detail you can add that will help dampen the sound leaving this room and provide sort of a more luxury and, and private feel to your space. In terms of the electrical, I am using metal boxes. It's my preferred method, uh, but again, you can absolutely use a different style. Uh, these ones here are gangable boxes, meaning they come in that individual one device style size, and then they can be modified. And in this case, I'm using the retrofit ones that they have the ears and I'm just gonna combine them to be a four gang switch box. I'm then gonna tie all of my wires into this box here and then just get it into that wall space there. And you'll see the ears of this box, that's the uh, parts that extend on the top and the bottom. They kind of sit tight against the drywall. There's a couple of clamps, they're called F brackets that kind of go in there and hold the, the, the box tight into that wall cavity. Again, you could absolutely, especially if you're in the States, you'll probably see those blue boxes I believe they're plastic or PVC maybe, and they do have a retrofit style one. So you could just buy a four gang box, three gang, whatever you have for your needs, put it into the space. And for here, you can kind of see, I just meredded all my neutrals together, put all my other leads in the back of the box and then tied in a temporary line onto a temporary switch so that we have working light for this project. And this here is what will eventually be the feed for the towel warmer. So this Romex here, this wire goes from this box location here over to the switches again, and just a single device box. Again, you can use one of those blue retrofit boxes if that's more popular in your area, but I'm just gonna shove the wires in this box, secure it to the wall, and then leave it for the time being. For the ceiling here, this is 5 8 inch drywall to match what was done with the existing ceiling. And so we are using inch and 5 8 coarse thread drywall screws just to secure it to the existing joists up above, as well as that blocking we had installed earlier to join both the existing drywall with our new piece. And again, that's going to help prevent any future cracking. And for this piece here, which we had taken out, we're using half inch green board. And we're just gonna drill out, mark all the locations for our stub outs. So that's the water lines, the drain, and the electrical down at the right hand side. That's what's gonna feed the LED lights in the niche, the accent lighting there. We have to put a driver uh, behind the vanity here. So we're just gonna get this green board into place and it's just raised off the floor. You can see we have a slight gap down there and we screw it into the framing. And then we have to start repairing any of our drywall or at least prepping to repair it. So here we're just sealing the brown paper here. Uh, just priming it and we're actually moving away from this product as we found it didn't do a great job this time around So we're using maybe a shellac based sealer for any ripped paper in the future And then any caulking like that that was left over we could just knife off there And then little holes like this one here We can just put a uh, piece of wood blocking behind it Cut a new piece of drywall out and just fill any holes like this one here This is also a really good opportunity to secure your floor and get rid of any existing squeaks or prevent any future squeaks. So we just mark out our joists and then put in a whole bunch of flooring screws along it. And this is just gonna really make it feel a lot more sturdy. And again, as mentioned, prevent any squeaks. The temporary shutoff we'd put in coming in handy, filling a bucket up with water to help us with all of our drywall work. Sebastian taking a pail here mixing up some sheetrock 45 with just a six inch knife it looks like and then he's going to use this to pre-fill any larger gaps and cracks and also a few different style of tape joints so this one here for example nice big ugly joint he's going to be using something called five fuse which is a type of tape uh, and you can use it with hot mud or in this case you know the sheetrock 45 would be hot mud and he's going to get that on there and fully embed it into the mud and then another few places you might use this style of mud would be any mesh tape joints. So this one, for example, where we just had a small piece to fill in, he can go ahead, embed it with that hot mud and just feather it out a little bit. The goal in this step here is we just want to get the tape on the wall. So you don't have to make it perfectly pretty. Don't worry uh, if you're a beginner, you don't have to have it looking all so nice on your first coat. This might take you five coats to get really nice or even more than that. Okay, don't worry about it. Don't stress about getting it perfect. We just want to try to smooth it out, feather it out as, as best you can, and then just let it set up and dry. 
for the majority of the mudding we do use machine mud so uh, in our case uh, we're just going to empty it into this bucket add a little bit of water take a mixing drill and just smooth it right on up to a nice creamy texture here and then uh, the reason why we put in this bucket is of course we can just get a lid on it so it, after we're done with it we just put the lid back on and that's going to keep it so that every day you can just open that bucket up and start mudding away do a coat a day and as you can see sebastian just getting it on there and really starting to feather it out um, and with each day he's going to feather out further and further when i was in the attic earlier on i did leave some wires up above the ceiling for the pot lights so here i just took a four and an eighth inch hole saw and drill out a hole in the center of this shower space here and then I'm going to pull the wire. I'm actually fishing over from a previous hole at the closer side to the door there. I'm going to bring a wire over, and then that way we have a temporary light in the shower as well. And we can start waterproofing it. So this here is Curdy Board. It's half inch thick, and it's a really nice system to use and work with. Very lightweight and very easy to install. And as you may have saw, very easy to cut. So here, you can just kind of mark it, and it does have these nice, uh, like a grid on it. So you can just kind of cut along that grid, take a knife, score the front break it and then score the back it's that easy and you do get these little washers as well and we're just using drywall screws with these washers in this case we're going to put these washers and screws you know every foot or so where two boards meet like this we're just going to take washers and put them right over that that joint there um it's just going to be a nice little trick there to get it in and as you can see you know you don't want to overdo it with these washers we do want to recess them so that it's it's kind of uh just beneath the top layer of the board but we don't want to overdo it we don't want to clamp them all the way down because this is just foam right it will just keep going and you can pull right through it if you over screw them and then on this side here we just have a few little things to cut out so sh shower head uh, shower arm there and then the uh, the valve and it can all be cut with either a knife or a multi-tool And a common theme you will see with a project like this one is a lot of mud work, right? So we'll do something uh, one day, say we're waterproofing, and then at the end of the day, coat of mud. Maybe we'll tile, end of the day, coat of mud. And this is just because the mud needs a lot of time to set up. So it makes sense just to do layer a day and then leave it. And you'll find that to maybe be a regular occurrence for yourself. And don't try to overdo it. Don't try to get it all perfect because this is a process that takes multiple coats and a lot of sanding to get nice. When we recessed our shower floor, we did also mark the location for the drain. So now I'm just going to drill that out. So this is just a five inch hole saw and I'm running this in reverse. Uh, if you have a five inch hole saw and you're trying to get through wood with it, you'll find it's going to want to bite and catch and uh, you don't want to break your wrists. So running it in reverse just on a slow speed setting it will still get through that plywood and we can expose that drain and this is the curdy drain here and i'm going to reduce ours it comes with a two inch board we're just going to put a reducer to inch and a half so we're just going to glue that in there and then we can kind of figure out the correct depth that we're going to need from our piece of uh from our from our trap here so i'm just going to use the foam piece that the the drain kind of comes with the pan comes with and then i'm going to measure the distance from that trap to our curdy drain here and then I can cut a piece of ABS at the correct length as per the measurement we got. You're going to want to do a dry fit and then you can just glue the one piece in. So I'm just going to glue it into the trap down below and then that way when it's time to waterproof and actually hook up the drain uh, we'll be ready to just glue the drain right into that little piece of ABS that's stubbed out from the trap. This here is the Curdy shower tray, and I believe this one comes in 38 by 60 inches. But our shower pan, I believe on this job, was maybe 60 inches by 32 inches. So we did just have to shave down the sides. In this case, we're using a skill saw, but you could even cut this with a knife if you wanted. Again, it's just foam. So we're going to measure from that drain center to the edges and then just kind of cut it, rip it down to, to length and size as we need to. And as we discussed earlier, we do have that one piece of vent that's sticking up through our, our shower floor. So I'm just going to go and notch a little section out to make room for that. So just using the multi-tool and being very careful not to pierce the top of this pan. Or the orange section is what the waterproofing actually is there. So I notch it out and do a dry fit and make sure that this fits into the space and is all perfectly flat on that floor there.
And then with your dry fit, you just want to take a little level here and just make sure you have the correct slope everywhere on each plane of this pan. And then with the pan in, another thing we can do is check to see how much it sticks above our floor here. So this is a half inch piece of curdy board. And as you can see, once I have it next to the pan, it's perfectly flush. So by doing this, of course, you could use a date measure too, but it's just to show that is a half inch. And now I know that we need to build up the rest of the floor half an inch to have a truly curbless shower. So here, we're just going to remove the door as we're going to have to do some floor work now and the door is going to be in the way. So we're going to take out those two hinges and just get the door out of here. And now we can start building up the floor. This here is sure ply. It's quarter inch thick plywood. And that's going to help us to build up the floor by the required amount. So we can cut this to size using a skill saw, multi-tool sawzle, jigsaw, whatever you may have. And we're going to glue and then use crown staples to get it into the floor. The Surply is a nice product because these X's that's just indicating where you need to staple it. So it just makes for a really easy install, especially when you have uh, sort of a power tool like this one that can just multi fire these staples into the floor. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to use this product. Uh, you don't have to use this fastening method, uh, depending on if you're even doing a curbless application. Uh, for many of you, you may have a curb and so you don't have to build up your floor uh, to the shower pan height or Maybe in some of your cases, you can actually notch, uh, shave down the top of your joists to recess that shower pan further. In our case, um, to get our bathroom floor height to be flat with the hallway floor height, we actually did have to build up this floor anyways. And then this here is Ditra heat peel and stick, and it's an uncoupling membrane. So when we talk about laying tile, we can't just lay on plywood. We need uh, some sort of system in place in which will be uh, an adequate substrate for a tile. Uh, Ditra is a really good system. This is Ditra heat peel and stick, meaning it is rated. Uh, you could put a heating cable in here and heat your floor. We're not doing that in this case. So the reason why we're doing this is one, we want that quarter inch of thickness. Regular Ditra is only an eighth inch thick. This is quarter inch. So this plus our plywood gives us that half inch we needed to have a flush surface with our shower pan. And two, the peel and stick method makes for an incredibly easy installation. As you can see, all we did there is peel off the film backing of this material and then just it just sticks right down to the plywood. We're then later going to roll it down as it is pressure activated. So just by kind of rolling it out, we'll get a really nice adhesion to the subfloor. And then that's it. The other bonus to this material here is it is waterproof. And you'll see in just a second how this comes into play, but it's going to enable us to really add some extra insurance to waterproofing our bathroom and knowing that we have a shower that's ready to go. And with that Dietra down, this means we are ready to start waterproofing. So we're going to start by filling a bucket with water and another one with just a, a minor amount of water as per the thin set manufacturer's specs. So in this case, we're using Schluter's All Set um, to mix our thin set. And this is what's going to enable us to waterproof. You'd see we had the vacuum attachment on our bucket. So as we're mixing it, that's just going to keep all the dust getting sucked up and out of the air. And we want to mix this to a nice consistency. Uh, when it comes to waterproofing, I do like the thin set a little bit on the thinner side. So if you look at the back of the bag, they'll tell you how much water you can use. And you want to use the amount that's going to give you the thinner consistency in your thin set. To apply this to the wall, I'm going to go over every single seam, every corner, and every screw hole in the curdy board. So I'm going to use the, the Schluter's Curdy Trowel to apply this. And I want to use directional troweling, meaning all of my trowel lines are going to be in the same direction. I just want to get some nice amount of coverage, all the thin set kind of wherever it needs to go. And I'm going to apply my banding, which can be cut with scissors or a knife over all of the thin set and embed it into place using drywall knives. When you are applying this and getting it over that thin set, you don't want to squeeze all of the thin set out from underneath your banding. The thin set is what's going to allow it to adhere to the curdy board. So as you're doing this, it may be tempting to watch it all squeeze out, but we're just trying to get rid of all the air. We're trying to collapse the ridges of these trowel lines. So once you trowel it all out again with your directional troweling, you can get that curdy band on there and then just slowly push it down with a drywall knife, get rid of any excess and just try to get all the air out from underneath. If you will be using the Schluter system, I would strongly recommend using the all set thin set just for this step. If you want to use it for tiling by all means, but it is an expensive thin set. That's why we just use it for the waterproofing because it does make a difference. And while according to them, there are other thin sets you can use. The all set is superior in my opinion 
and when it comes to waterproofing, we don't want to mess around. And then for all of the washers and the screw holes, we're just going to cut the banding into nice little squares. Uh, you could absolutely do it in longer horizontal or vertical lines, uh, just with like, you know, a singular piece of banding. Uh, but the squares means just less banding going to waste and less thin set going to waste. And then with the walls done, we can put the pan in. So again, just a little test fit, make sure everything's still good. And then we can wet our substrate. So here, the plywood, we just want to get a little bit of water in it. That way it's not pulling all the moisture out from the thin set. And you can see again, that right corner there, we had that vent. So I'm just take a little piece of curdy band and staple it into place. That way we can get thin set down there. It's not going to fall in. We can fully fill that little uh, gap that we notch from the pan with thin set and have a really solid uh, surface for it to bond to and then here just using a quarter inch square notch trowel again directional troweling for the entirety of this pan here I'm going to get that foam spacer into place glue up the curdy drain here and then glue up the tailpiece sticking out of that trap push them together that's going to bond it into place it's going to sit into all of that thin set and then I can go ahead get the pan put it into place and just tamp it all down I'm just going to do the little shuffle here to fully embed it into that thin set for any corners you may have, they do make these inside and outside corners. So you can just go ahead, trowel out um, the three different planes, and then embed your corner. Use two drywall knives, one to hold it in place and one to collapse those ridges, get all the air out from underneath. As you can see here, just getting a good healthy amount of thin set in there. And then again, taking those drywall knives and just gently collapsing those ridges, getting all the air out. I'm not trying to pull all of the thin set out from underneath that banding any of the corners where the pan meets the walls again more banding you can see we're just going to cut it very easily with a knife and then just embed it again and we're going to rinse and repeat for the three walls here when it comes to the two walls here that's going to reach outside of the shower area we're going to go ahead and extend the banding even further past that as this is a curbless shower so when we think about what that means, uh, when we have a shower, the grout will eventually allow water to penetrate it, right? And it will find its way to the shower pan below the tile. And there's no curb to contain that water. So while the pan is sloped, the majority of the water should find its way to the drain. It's not impossible for water to wick upwards over time. So by embedding some banding well outside of the shower area, that's just gonna ensure us a little extra layer of protection and extend uh, just how durable this shower install is. And around the drain too, you will be provided with one of these collar pieces. So we're just gonna trowel it out just like everywhere else and embed this uh, kind of donut shaped curdy band into place here. And the last piece of waterproofing for this application is just gonna be where the uh, Ditra meets with the shower pan. So we're just gonna same thing, trowel out over that line there get a piece of banding and we're going to go from wall to wall. Once again, the Ditra is waterproof and this way we have a completely watertight install. The next day after everything had set up with all the waterproofing, we can start configuring our tile layout and tiling the floors. Now in this job we are going to be using a large format tile we're going to use that not only for the bathroom floor but for the shower floor as well i am a huge uh, believer in large format tile especially for shower floors traditionally mosaics or penny whatever type of tile you're putting in there it's just so much grout which means so much maintenance and i like to try and move away from that however this comes with a, another kind of set of challenges uh, when we have large format tile and we think about a shower pan like this one, there's four different planes. Uh, so from each wall or from where the entrance is, there's a plane of slope that's going to eventually reach that drain. And the tile is so large in this case that it's going to extend over multiple planes, which means we're going to add relief cuts because we need that tile to be able to slope appropriately with the shower pan slope. 
So the first step here is we're going to take our tile and cut it to fill in this sort of rectangular shower space. Once we have that, and you can see we marked out the drain location in the center there with a pencil, we're going to then take a flat edge and mark from corner of that drain to each of the corners of the shower pan. So just taking the straight edge here, you can see, and just taking a pencil and marking a nice straight line from corner to corner. Once we have that, we can go ahead and label each of the pieces in order, just like how you would read a book uh, for those of you that can read. And this is going to help us uh, put the pieces back in later on as you're going to have quite a few pieces to all fit into place and they're going to have very specific places. So we had all our lines marked now. We can just take it to the wet saw here and just cut along every single pencil line. And I would recommend, I think if you're going to be attempting an envelope cut, which this is called, um, I would recommend maybe going out and renting, uh, you know, a nicer wet saw for at least this part of the job. For the majority of cuts, you can get away with, say, a snap cutter and a grinder. Uh, but I think when you have exposed cuts like this, I personally have always found that I, the best results I can get using a wet saw. And then once all of our cuts are made, we need to polish them as they are exposed cuts. We don't want any jagged edges on our tile, especially not where feet will be uh, walking on top of. So this here is a grinder with a 200 grit polishing pad. I find that for porcelain tile like this, that creates uh, a really nice smooth bevel on the, the cut edge there. So we're just going to go along each edge and slowly round it over, get rid of any jaggedness. And then we want to just dry fit all of our cuts. Um, Reason for this is that any adjustments that you may have to make, maybe your cuts weren't perfect, uh, it's easier to do that ahead of time versus once your tiles are covered in thin set and you're just a mess. So for this, just a little bit of a dry fit. We want to just make sure everything fits relatively into position. We don't need to be perfect. We can make all the micro adjustments once we have thin set. This is the curdy drain that comes in three pieces. So we're just going to insert kind of the drain grate into the collar here. And then we're going to have a height adjustment ring that we're going to fit over top of that. And this piece here is what is going to allow us to set the drain to be of the same height of the surrounding tile or even a little bit below the tile. We don't want that drain over that tile as, of course, it needs to be the lowest point. Water needs to be able to find its way into this drain. And just like earlier, we're going to mix up some thin sets. So you can see we got that vacuum going again. And this time we're going to mix up our thin set to be a little bit thicker as we are setting tile now. I like this at, you know, call it a peanut butter consistency, I suppose. And for this, we are using Mape Carabon T thin set in white. Um, you, This is a thin set that's rated to be installed over uh, Schluter products and also rated for large format tile like what we're working with here. To install this tile, we will be using a half inch square notch trowel and we want to directionally trowel it. So that's again, all of those trowel lines going in the same direction. And then we're going to back butter each and every piece. So when I say back buttering, I just mean uh, when we have the trowel lines on the floor here with the tile, we're just going to take some thin set and spread it out using the flat side of the trowel on that back of the tile. That way, we're going to get the best level of adhesion as we install this stuff. And with each of the grout lines, anywhere tile meets, I like to have two of these uh, wedges uh, style system. So we're using 1 16th grout spacers and it's the style in which later on we can put, you can see now those orange wedges in and that's going to reduce any lippage on these tiles. Now keep in mind, uh, because I have had some questions about this, this doesn't make the tiles level, it just reduces lippage. So when you see these relief cuts, that's those diagonal cuts that run from corner to corner. That is separating the planes of the slope here. Uh, it's not going to pull up the tiles anywhere that there's a wedge to be flat with each other. It's just going to pull them up in a micro adjustment kind of uh, manner to get rid of any small amounts of lippage. So no, this isn't going to get rid of all of your slope. Although as you're installing this, you should have a level nearby and be checking for slope as you're doing this just to be 100% sure. You may have also noticed that I didn't start putting in any of the wedges until I had the full drain surrounded here. That's because these envelopes can be quite tricky to have everything line up perfectly. So I do like to just get the majority of the pieces in and I don't lock them in. That way I can make any small adjustments 
once I have everything pretty much good to go, then I can start inserting the wedges. When it comes to installing large format tile, especially in a uh, shower floor, something else we want to think about is what is called the COF or the coefficient of friction, I believe it is. Uh, basically, we want to make sure the tile isn't going to be too slippy. So in this application, this is a matte tile. And if you were really concerned, you could look up the COF of your tile. Although generally, if you just feel the tile, um, as, as silly as this may sound, you should be able to feel whether it's going to be a slip hazard or not. Um, and, and typically with a matte tile, it will be good to go. But again, if you're really paranoid, you can look up that COF. And then as we're tiling here, uh, you can see I just have a spare piece of curdy board that I'm using to kneel on, just to help protect my knees and the longevity of them. Could of course wear knee pads, but I've always found those to be uncomfortable. And then same thing, we're just going to continue trawling up this floor. Wherever there's detour, we do want to fill all these thin, thin set into those voids and then trowel it out and again back buttering each and every piece. You will notice that the only full tile in this floor here is that center tile so it's oftentimes easier to put that full tile in and that way you can take the measurements for the next tile based off that full tile. So for example with that right tile there we installed the full piece took a tape measure measured from edge to wall edge to wall cut the tile and then we could insert it into place and when it comes to say the toilet cutout all you can do there is first you cut the tile to the length and then you'll mark the drain location. So you take your tile, measure the center of the drain and with a toilet, I believe it's a seven inch diameter. So you just want to make a, a circle, seven inch diameter, and then just cut it out with a grinder. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle. It will be hidden with a toilet eventually. So don't stress too much about having it be all pretty like that. Another thing that you should probably take note of is uh, when you ever you have a tile next to a wall, you do want to leave a slight gap, just, you know, a quarter inch gap or so between the tile edge and that wall, as we do want to leave room for expansion and contraction of these walls. And anywhere where we get a little tight as we're doing this, uh, because it is just drywall, you could always after the fact, uh, maybe you cut your tile too big. You could always just notch the bottom of that drywall out a little bit too, worst case scenario. Uh, but again, it's just easier to cut it a little bit shy uh, for the most part here. And then once we get to that door, we're just going to take a spare piece of tile, uh, put it right up to that door jam, and then this way we can undercut the door jam. So when we come to tiling this section, we can just slide the new tile right underneath that door jam. And speaking of the doorway, typically we like to have our transition happen under the closed door. So if you picture the door being back in place, we want that tile, the grout line, the edge of it to end right under the midway point of where the closed door would be. This way, afterwards, we can take a piece of hardwood flooring and have the transition just be perfectly hidden under that door. The next day, once it's all set up, you can come in, remove all your wedges. This is a lot easier to do the next day. Although, say it's a Friday and you, know, you don't have time till Monday, you can wait till Monday. The thin set will just be a lot harder at that point and a little bit trickier to clean out of any grout lines, but it can still be done. So here we removed all the wedges just by kicking them out. You could also use a rubber mallet and then any thin set that's kind of uh, left in those grout lines, you can just take a knife and just kind of score it out. You want to be gentle with this. You don't want to chip a tile and you don't want to cut into the waterproofing below, especially. And then this here is the fit uh, floor register, the flush mount. So we just cut our tile uh, very precisely to size of this kind of black uh, piece here. And then we can screw this in to the metal surround from that duct work. And if you're a beginner, I would probably stick away from this as you do need some pretty precise cuts for it to end up looking good. Um, but it is a nice product uh, for sure if you think you are up for the challenge. And then we can go ahead and cover our floors. So this is just brown paper. We're going to use painter's tape to adhere it down to the porcelain tile. And this is going to protect our tile while we're doing more tiling, mudding, painting, all that fun stuff. Sebastian here with the Festool drywall sander. It's hooked up to a HEPAVAC, so there's just absolutely no dust, hence why we can do this without a door on the bathroom. Although for you guys, I would imagine you're going to be hand sanding this, so you definitely want to put the door back up and put a mask on for this. Uh, but Sebastian is going to give this a light sanding before doing his final coat. And this is just going to ensure that we get some extremely smooth results. And then we can start tiling the walls. So we're going to start with this back wall here. And this wall is going to be the easiest wall to do 
because there's nothing involved with it. It's just a straight flat wall all the way up. No niche, no shower fixtures. So to get our first row here, I'm going to take a tile and then flip it over. I have a laser line established at about the six inch mark, and I'm just going to take a pencil and mark both edges where that laser line is. I'm then going to flip the tile over and transfer those lines to be now on the front face of the tile. And the reason for this is that once we make the cut on this laser line, uh, we'll be able to flip the tile back over after it's cut and the cut edge will be facing the floor. And as you can see, I'm just going to take the pencil. We have those lines on the back, which I just drew right in the middle of that laser line. I'm going to transfer them over to the tile and then we're going to be able to take this tile to the wet saw and start on one pencil line and end on the other. And you may be wondering, why are you starting at the six inch mark? Why don't you start with a full tile? Well, in this job, we have eight foot ceilings and we're using 12 by 24 inch tile. The problem being is that's not a true 12 inches. Uh, it's actually shy of that. So if we were to use a full tile to start with, our top tile would end up being a sliver cut, maybe somewhere between an inch and two inch piece of tile. And it's gonna look bad. So instead what we're doing is starting with a half tile and that way we can end with a half tile. And then for our first row, this is by far the most important part. You need this first row to be perfectly level. If you have an imperfection and it's off of level, especially when you're doing a grid style laid out or a stacked style like what we're doing here, that imperfection is going to grow and grow as you get up. And you're gonna be pulling your hair out by the time you're halfway up because of how hard it is to tile when you're off of level. And so to help with this process, you'll notice at the bottom of the floor there, we have those little red wedges, and those are fantastic for making any micro adjustments. And we also do want to keep that first row off of the floor a little bit. We want a slight gap that will be filled with silicone later on, and that's going to help allow for contraction and expansion of the floors, ceiling and walls. Now, when we tile walls, we personally prefer to trowel out the back of the tile when we're working with large format tile and back butter the walls. We've just found this to be a cleaner method for us, it just kind of works a little bit better, but you can absolutely trowel the wall and back butter your tiles. It comes down to personal preference. This also helps if you have two people, you can have one person troweling the tiles and the other just installing them and it'll speed up the process a good bit. And then once again, you can see we have those wedge style uh, spacers there. So these ones are 1 16th, as we'd mentioned, and we're just going to kind of get our tiles in and then wedge them in, lock them into each other and get rid of any lippage. And you'll also notice we do even have red wedges after that first row. And we're going to use these uh, anytime we need micro adjustments. So these tiles here, are, you know, they're made in India. They're not always perfect, even though they're rectified that means they should all be cut at the factory to be the same size you may find slight uh, discrepancies with your tile size and even if it's something as small as 1 64th of an inch well you got to remember if you're using 1 16th grout lines 1 64th is 25 percent of your grout line and that can cause some room for error so the red wedges are just going to really help everything be perfect when you're setting your tiles, you do want to really push them onto that wall and then you can even move them up and down side to side to help collapse those ridges of thin set. We want to get rid of any air behind the tile. So once we install the tile, you do just want to kind of push it around, apply some pressure, get those ridges to collapse. Another thing you might consider is if your tile has veining or, or prints, you will want to try to avoid any duplicates right next to each other. And if you're feeling really fancy, if your tile allows for it, you can try to get the veining to flow from tile to tile. Although with some of these tiles, um, that's just impossible because none of the veining will ever line up. But it's something you can you can aim for if, if you're willing to go that extra mile. And I didn't address this when we were tiling the floor, but the reason for this layout is that the floor tile, once exposed, you'll notice the floor just kind of waterfalls up this wall because they're the same layout and it's going to look really clean. And once again, we're doing that center full tile first before the two side tiles. That way we put our center tile up and then we can just take the measurement from the bottom of the tile to the wall and then from the top of the tile to the wall and cut our tile accordingly. Obviously, if you have perfectly plumb walls, you just need one measurement. Um, but when you're working with large format tile, you may have to cut them at a slight angle to account for any uh, walls that are out of plumb. And then once you get to the ceiling, uh, you're going to set your final row 
and then just kind of take measurements from the top of that tile to the ceiling and you're going to want to leave a little bit of a gap from the top of your tile to the ceiling we like to aim for maybe an eighth of an inch gap and again that's something we will eventually fill with silicone and that's going to allow for any movement in our ceiling and the expansion and contraction so with that back wall done we can now kind of frame in our niche here so you can see i just shot the laser level across that grout line there at about you know belly height let's call it and then this way i can cut out my niche so that the bottom of the niche will run alongside with that grout line and that's going to create just a nice clean look with our tile and also an easier time with tiling i'm then also going to establish the grout line uh, just above that in this way we can put in our divider for our niche because we are doing two here and i can make sure that that one corresponds with the grout line as well this is the 28 by 12 prefab schluter niche and i use it to make uh, just trace out the kind of the, the square rectangle on the wall there cut it out with a multi-tool and then i can install backing all the way around this so that i can uh, easily fasten the niche into position i'm going to make a couple holes and poke the low voltage wire through those holes and that's good it's going to connect the uh, accent lights later on and then just like installing the curdy board we're going to use those washers and screws fasten it all into place and then waterproof every single uh, one of those seams there. So same thing with the uh, other waterproofing we had done using the Curdy trowel, getting that thin set on there, flattening it all down with a drywall knife and just getting good uh, amount of overlappage onto both the niche and the Curdy board. And then with the niche in, we can tile this wall. So what we're doing here is we're going to have a full tile on the left hand side and then the cut tile on the right hand side that way because we have a cut tile on the finished wall in that corner already it's going to kind of give that appearance of that tile wrapping around and then we end on a nice full tile it's just going to be the cleanest look in my opinion for how far we extend that tile I want to go maybe anywhere two three inches past the grout line that defines the shower pan kind of space and that's going to give us plenty of room once we get our glass in here and and have something to uh, mount our glass to so anyways we're going to start very similar to the other wall uh, we're working that full tile up first once that full tile is in place we can take the measurements off the edge of it to the wall there and then cut another tile and just work our way up this wall back buttering the wall troweling out the tiles collapsing those ridges wedging everything together and then once we get to the niche we can go ahead and cut our tiles for the niche cutout and the way we do this is i'm actually going to cut the tiles to be just a little bit past the edge of that niche we want them to overhang the niche by maybe a 16th eighth of an inch that's going to give us a little bit of a safety net to make sure that when we come to when it comes to finishing this niche we can have the uh, best possible results here and then to get the divider piece in place and again this just comes with the niche i'm just gonna uh, embed the sides and back of it with thin set and just push it into place there and uh, then work my way up with these tiles just continuing to go on up and i can kind of mark out the cuts for this so for this tile here i have to make an l cut so I just marked it with a pencil line uh, where it was necessary and we can just take the wet saw and go uh, and make a nice square here and with the wet saw you may find you're not able to fully uh, cut right to that corner uh, so for this what we do is the majority of the cut with the wet saw and then we might take it outside get the grinder and just finish off that cut when you have some cut similar to this where there's only like a two inch piece at the bottom there you want to be extremely careful as this tile is just wanting to break on you something else that's nice to have although not necessary when you're doing niches is uh clamps and a lot of clamps are reversible so like these ones here just kind of reverse them and that's just going to help support that little divider piece we put in as it is only sitting there with thin set now the type of thin set here doesn't really sag a whole lot so it should be good without these clamps but just a nice little extra safety net that you can use if you want to and to give you a better look at this so you can see i'm just going to make a pencil line kind of at the outside edge of the niche at the top there and then another line corresponding with the tile it's already cut so the two cuts will be at the exact same height and it's going to look uh nice and clean this way
And then for the top of this niche here, you can actually see we have the top of the tile overhang it quite a bit. Reason being is I wanted these two niches to be perfectly symmetrical and the bottom one being only 12 inches in height. I want to make the top one 12 inches in height too. We could have gone taller, but I think I prefer just the look of symmetry here possibly um so anyways we're just gonna have it overhang and then later on once this is set up we can get some extra curdy board and just kind of fill that gap uh at the top of that one niche there and the final step to this wall is we do just want to cap off the edge of it we don't want those exposed porcelain edges so i'm going to just take a drywall knife and fill a bunch of extra fresh thin set into that void there between the tile and the backer and then this way I can cut a tile profile to the same length from the floor to the ceiling and you can just use tin snips to cut this if you really wanted to and we're just going to push it in between the tile and the wall there and so that fresh thin set we just added is going to squeeze out we take a sponge clean it up and we just space it a little bit if you need to so that you can get grout between the tile profile and the tiles. The next day you are now ready to remove your clamps if you have any and any wedges. Uh, for this you would want a rubber mallet, it's what we would typically use. Don't know where that went this day, so instead just using the back end of a screwdriver, smashing these out of place, and then any leftover thin set in the grout lines again, just a, a knife, and you don't want to go too deep with it, but just gently scraping out any dried thin set. The final sand here. So Sebastian with the fest tool, getting this all nice and smooth. And when it comes to final sand, again, I wouldn't expect you to have a tool like this. So you will be hand sanding, I would imagine. It's gonna be extremely dusty. It's gonna be bad. I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you. It's gonna suck. So, uh, you know, just wear a mask, uh, sand away, and it'll be over before you know it. And after that, uh, we can go ahead and prime. So any new drywall in any mudded areas, we just want to hit with the primer. This is Sherwin Williams Cover Max. It's a great primer. And we're just going to hit all of that new stuff. This is the inner part of our tileable floor register um, that we kind of showcased a little bit earlier on. So the middle part, I just like to fill up with thin set. I drill a few holes in the back of it, and then I take the piece of tile and I just put it into there and squeeze down into it till it's flush with the edges, removing all that excess thin set. And as you're tiling, you might want to consider having a toothbrush on hand to clean out grout lines as you go. Uh, it's just easier to clean out wet thin set than dry thin set, and a toothbrush is great for that. When it comes to finishing niches, there are three primary ways, I would say. Uh, the first being what you're seeing here, these threshold pieces, just a man-made stone. You could even use quartz, I suppose, or, or another stone. And you just want to do kind of the uh, the bottom, top, and sides with the stone. And then the back, you could either use an accent tile or the same tile as your wall tile. The other method would be uh, to tile the size and then use tile profiles um, on the kind of the edges of those. And then the third method would be mitering your tiles. And in terms of difficulty, it is in the same order I just listed them. So this is actually our first time doing sort of this threshold finish it was at the client's request. And I must say, this is by far going to be your easiest method. And I see this one done a lot with uh, especially like subway tiles. I see this a lot. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a nice, simple way to finish off the niche. You just take your threshold pieces, you're going to cut them to size. And in our case, these ones did come with a bevel. So we did have them just extend a little bit past that wall tile so that the bevel would start with the wall tile and then kind of end just a little bit past it. And we're just going to give those bottom pieces a nice pitch outwards. We want it to any water to fall into the drain. And at the top side there, you could just see a couple of aluminum tracks. That's what's going to house those LED lights. So we just want to put that in the top corner. And then when we do this, I'm not troweling out with thin set. I'm just getting a nice big glob um, on the entirety of those pieces. That way I can push it into place. And I just want to watch all that thin set squeeze out there. And I know that way I have 100% coverage. But more importantly is I'm able to manipulate the piece uh, however I might want to. Uh, when it comes to finishing niches, you know, you have to be really precise with your finishes. So getting the right uh, pitch and slope and having everything line up is really important. And again, you'll notice these red wedges coming into play here, uh, spacing, making micro adjustments as we need it. And something we did here is you'll notice that back piece of tile, I did continue the grout line 
um, that were flowing through these niches into that as traditionally that's how we would do it if we were finishing uh, a, a niche that was done with tile profiles or mitered edges is I like uh, the look of that continuation of the grout line. I got to say though in hindsight looking at the threshold pieces they kind of break up that grout line and I don't think having that grout line in the back of the niche was necessary here. So I think maybe if you're considering doing a niche with these threshold pieces uh, and you do have grout lines running through it, you might want to consider leaving that step out of it. But I think that does also come down to personal preference. And then again, once you have everything pretty much wrapped up, you just clean it up, get the toothbrush in there, wet damp sponge, get all that thin set out of there. And then the final wall here, this is pretty much the, the same as uh, previous walls were. Uh, the only exception to this wall specifically is you will notice that we are troweling out both the back of the tile and the wall reason being is we did have some imperfections with the, the the plumbness of this wall let's call it and to work these out we're just kind of manipulating the amount of thin set we have in certain areas to account for that now i think if you're a beginner in your tiling and especially with large format tile uh, it's better to address these issues at the framing stage so if you need to you can alter uh, maybe plane down some studs replace them sister them um, all sorts of different things can be done. You can even wet shim. Uh, you can look into wet shimming if you have really bad walls to get some nice plum flat walls. But in our case here, um, we have run into these issues before. So by manipulating the amount of thin set in certain places, we are able to kind of correct any minor issues with the imperfections of our existing wall, let's call it. Another thing to note with this wall is uh, that shower valve. So we cut that out just using a grinder. We just wanted to make sure that the finished trim plate was gonna cover that hole. So if you have that handy, you can just double check and make sure your cuts will be hidden by the plate. And then for these stub outs here with our shower fixtures, uh, you can just use a diamond tipped hole saw, which again, you can either put on a drill or a grinder uh, just to make those holes there for, for those connections. And just like the other wall, we're going to go ahead, take some nice fresh thin set and get it into the gap here between the tile and that drywall there. And then this way, once we cut our tile profile to size, we're just going to push it into there. It's going to have that fresh thin set to bond to keep it in place. And then any time between coats, so you know, here we primed, we're just going to give it a very light sanding and this is just going to give us the best possible results when it comes to painting. This is Sherwood Williams premium ceiling paint. I'm just going to roll it onto the ceiling, let that set up, and then we can also cut in at this time. And when it comes to cutting in for the ceiling, because we do do the ceiling first, uh, we can go ahead and cut in a little bit on the walls too. We don't have to be really precise. And after priming, it's a good idea to go around with a flashlight and you can look for any imperfections like these fish eyes, for example. Uh, so for this, we're just going to go around the flashlight, circle any of our touch up spots, add some colorant to the mud here. And then Sebastian's just going to go around, hit all of those imperfections. Once they set up, he can give it a very light sanding, hit it with some more primer in those spots, and then we're ready to paint all of the walls at that point. Here is the transition from tile to hardwood flooring. So the clients fortunately had a spare piece of flooring left over. So here we're just taking some construction adhesive. We're going to get that into the, uh, the, the subfloor there. And then we can kind of line these pieces up uh, and we cut this piece just using a skill saw and a track. And then we can use these wedges below those door stops to get them to be perfectly flat with the hardwood and the tiled floor. And eventually those gaps will be filled with sealant as you will see later on. With the ceiling now completely finished, we can put in the pot lights. So we already had the two holes for temporary work lights for two pot lights. We'll just drill out this final pot light in the center and pull the wire out and tie in our pot lights. In hindsight, I do wish we would have moved that fan a little bit closer to the wall to further separate these two, but it's not the end of the world here. And then with these pot lights, they are just four inch LED wafer style lights and they do have a color selecting switch. So you can switch between 3000, 4000, 5000 K, which is color temperatures. With this bathroom, we set them at 4,000K, just like a, a nice, you know, kind of soft white. It's not as yellow as, say, 3,000K, which might clash against the white tiles. So, uh, but, you know, you play around with it. 
And here is the connection for our LED accent lighting. Uh, so we're just gonna, this is actually a three wire, but we only need two. So I just cut that third wire there. And I'm just gonna strip the ends of all this and attach these butt splices onto here. So it's just a little red connector that gets crimped onto the wire. And then you can go ahead and take the cable out of the wall here, crimp it to the connections coming off of that LED tape light. And then we can sh put some heat shrink on this, heat it up to get it nice and tight over all those connections in the cable. And then we can just shove this wire into the wall. And this is a 5000K uh, water rated LED tape light uh, with high density diode placement. And so you can see, we just kind of shove that back into the hole. I don't bother filling it with silicone. If you're really paranoid, you could, but I just, I don't foresee any issues from the small hole in the top side of a niche here. So we're just going to shove that back in peel off the adhesive backing from the tape light, push it up against that channel, the aluminum channel there. And then we can cut the diffuser that comes with that channel to size and just push it up into position there. And to bridge the gap between the wall and the tile profile here, we just take some blue painter's tape and give a very slight reveal in that tile profile so that the uh, paintable caulking has something to bond to. We're just gonna get that in there and then just kind of smooth it out with a finger wet rag. And then this way, uh, when we go ahead and paint it, we can pull it off and get a nice crisp line. And when it comes to painting Sebastian here, he's just rolling out the walls first, and then he'll let this set up a bit and then go back to cut in all of the corners and especially where it meets the ceiling, it's just gonna cut in by hand. Unfortunately, I do not have the name of this paint. It was from Benjamin Moore. Um, you know, we're, we're personally more Sherman Williams guys, but Benjamin Moore has a nice paint too. And you can see here, Sebastian going in by hand with a brush here, cutting in, and then he's going to back roll. He just has a little hand roller there, and that's going to reduce the amount of brush strokes. And once he has the paint over this joint here with the, the caulking, he's going to pull back that painter's tape to get a nice crisp line revealed there. And now we can grout. So this here is Laticrete Permacolor in Frosty, which is a nice light gray. So we're gonna put it in the little bucket this time, again with the vacuum there, just a small amount of water for this. And we're gonna mix it up with a small drill and a small mixing paddle on low speed. Uh, once we have it all mixed up according to the manufacturer's instructions, we can go back with the grout float and just start embedding it into all of these grout joints. You wanna push it into each joint and then just work it off uh, get all the excess out of there. And we're just going to work our way in this whole shower. The three walls maybe took 10 minutes to do when it comes to large format tile and, and you know, 1 16th grout joints, it's just not a lot of grout needed. So you can make short work of this. Um, and when we talk about grouting, there's something called grout haze that can occur. So if you were to grout and then leave it and not clean it up in time, a haze could uh, kind of set up on the surface of your tile, which becomes really challenging to clean. Uh, it, not to say it's impossible to clean, but it will require a lot of elbow grease and you'd be surprised at how hard it can be to get this stuff off. So we wanna be careful with timings here. So for us to do this whole bathroom, probably had it grouted in about 20 minutes, if even. So by the time we did the walls and then finished off with the floor, the grout had set up enough on the walls to give it its first wash. Um, so you'll see here, we're just gonna work our way out from the bathroom floor. And again, the elapsed time I would probably say is around 20 minutes. And so then we can get back in there, just a couple of damp sponges. And when I say damp, I mean, you want to wet these and then wring them out so that no more drops come out. And you're just going to kind of work off any of the excess grout at a 45 degree angle. So just kind of move that sponge over those grout lines gently. We don't want to take the grout out from the grout lines, so just gently taking it off the surface and getting it mostly clean. We're still gonna have a little bit of leftover haze, but that's okay. So we're gonna let that sit for another hour or so. It really kind of depends on the temperatures of your room, the grout you're working with, and what the manufacturers spec it for. But you see, after some more setting time, come back in here with the microfiber cloths. One of them's dry, one of them's just a little bit damp. So I'm mostly using the dry one, but any tough areas where the haze is set up a little bit too much, I can hit with the damp one. Uh, just to kind of loosen it up and then once again go over it with the dry one to fully clean those tiles. And a good trick if you want to make sure you got all your haze, you can just kind of look if there's any existing lights in the room. Try to look at the tile at different angles and you should be able to very clearly see the haze. 
And then to finish off this transition, we're gonna take a color matched silicone. So this is Laticil in Frosty, the same color as the grout. And we're gonna fill that, that gap between the flooring there and the tile. And we wanna use silicone for this. If you use grout, it will crack out, it will fail. Do not grout this gap, okay? So use the color matched silicone there and then just some brown caulking between uh, the old hardwood and the new transition piece there. And just kind of fill it up and then clean it all out there. And as we were grouting, we were not filling any of these corners with grout because we wanted to make room for this silicone here. And once again, this is the color match silicone. I'm just gonna lay a nice bead in all of the change of planes. And I'm gonna spray it with some soapy water. So that's just a little spray bottle with water, a couple spurts of hand soap in it. And then this way, I'm gonna take a popsicle stick and just kind of clean it up and shape that nice joint there of silicone and and kind of smooth it all out the soapy water is going to prevent the silicone from sticking to any other surfaces so get the bead spray popsicle stick and we end up with a really clean silicone line there and we're going to do that again for any change of plane um, and including the insides of the niches when it comes to trim this here, I'm doing some nice new baseboards, and you should be using either wood or PVC for in a bathroom. With that being said, can you use MDF? Sure, you just have to make sure it's properly sealed and it's not gonna be getting soaked down. So if you have kids, you know, you may especially not wanna try it, but um, I think if you wanted to use MDF, as long as you're sealing the bottom side and maybe there's even a conversation to be had about siliconing where the bottom of the trim meets the tile floor, it's definitely a conversation to be had around that, but your best bet is to just use real wood or PVC here. We're just going to cut this piece to size and then brad nail it into the framing of the wall here. Along the top, we are going to use a paintable caulking. Uh, we like the crown molded rated one uh, from Alexandria, I believe, as it's less prone to cracking. And any of the brad nail holes, we're just going to fill with some spackle and then sand that down and paint it after. And we do do our first coat of paint uh, before the trim's on the wall. We use Sherwin-Williams trim paint. So before we get the vanity in, we do just wanna get these shutoffs on these water lines. It's gonna be much easier to do now versus working inside a tight vanity. So here we're using the crimp on shutoffs. And I like the quarter turn ones. And we wanna make sure we get that excussion plate on there before the shutoff and uh, and we again we did stub out with pecs um, you can actually now I've, I've seen them you can get some like chrome sleeves to cover your pecs with which is going to be a cleaner look I'm not sure where exactly to get them but if you don't like the look of some stubbed out pecs which I completely understand you can get a sleeve to cover it with and then we just lift our vanity into position we just want to do a little test fit make sure it's kind of at least somewhat square with the walls and oftentimes with these vanities, your countertop will have a slight overhang. So with this one here, came with a filler strip. So we're just gonna tack it in a couple times. And then this way, once we push it into the wall, the countertop will have an even overhang on both the left and the right side of the vanity. And there won't be any sort of visible gap between the vanity and the wall. And then just to fasten this into place, we're just gonna put three screws in this one. A um, couple spots because this wall wasn't very flat. We just have to shim it out uh, in a couple spots here. So we're just gonna use three inch construction screws going right through the back of this vanity here and then into the studs, which we had marked in the wall there. We can then bring our countertop in and we're just gonna once again, do a little test fit here, drop it into place. And once we know it's good, we can just lift it back up a little bit and apply a nice bead of silicone along the top edge here. We don't have to go crazy with it. This will, you know, it's a heavy unit. It's not going anywhere, so you don't have to go wild with the silicone, but just a bit to keep it steady. And then this one does have both a back and side splash. So we're just going to, again, nice globs of silicone to adhere these pieces to the wall. And then where stone meets stone, we're going to use white silicone as it's just a white countertop. And we're just going to apply beads. And just like we did in the shower there, uh, we're going to apply a nice bead, soapy water, and then popsicle stick it out to a nice smooth uh, and even bead. And where it meets the wall, we're going to use another bead of paintable caulking for this one. So silicone on the stone, caulking where it meets the wall, and paintable so that later on we can touch it up and uh, paint it a little bit. And if you have a really large gap, if your walls are really bad, you may want to put some backer rod in between the backsplash and the wall.
to strengthen that and prevent any future cracking. In this case, it wasn't too, too bad. So we were able to get away with just the caulking. And then where tile meets ceiling, just some white silicone and similar process to the other joints with the silicone. However, I have found based off of previous jobs, this is the area that's by far the most prone to cracking. I believe it's probably because it is an attic above. There's a lot more movement, I would imagine. So with this now, we've just started doing a little bit of a larger joint of silicone than elsewhere. So for here, instead of a popsicle stick, we're still using a popsicle stick, but we just kind of cut it at a 45 degree angle to have a larger gap. And then we can put in all these shower fixtures. So this is the uh, rain head bar here. It's going to three to four revolutions of Teflon and then some pipe dope. And then with that, we can just take out the brass nipple that was in place here, screwing it counterclockwise. And there'll be a little bit of water in here because we did uh, pressurize the system. And then we can screw in the shower arm so that the uh, it's nice and snug. We want to get that plate to cover the hole and then have it pointed down. And then we can screw in the rain head. And with any shower fixtures, you might want to look into something called a flow restrictor valve. These, uh, you know, you could maybe remove them to get better water flow. Uh, but you didn't hear this from me, and I won't be showing you how to do that. But just maybe something to look into for you there. And then the handheld unit here, again, removing that brass nipple. And then you can pick up uh, these brass nipples uh, and they come in every half inch increment. So I believe the one that worked here was maybe three inches. So we take uh, the, the nipple, test the size. Once we know it's good, we can uh, put Teflon and pipe dope around both edges, put it into the hose adapter piece, which is this black piece. And we just want to snug it up with a pair of channel locks and we're going to screw it into the drop here that's behind the wall here until it's really nice and snug. And then this fixture was really nice because it has this screw so that we can adjust the height of it or, or the depth rather. And it has a gasket behind it. So it's just gonna pull itself right up against that tile and the gasket's gonna compress and just be watertight. And then we can go ahead and put our shower valve trim pieces in. And this is usually about several thousand pieces that you got to all put together. So just follow the instructions for yours, get them in where they got to go. And for the actual trim piece here, it came with this sort of like 3M self adhesive. I went ahead and cut that off and just put a nice bead of silicone, with a little gap at the bottom. That way, if any water does find its way behind this plate, it has a place to drip out of at the bottom there. But we just get that bead of silicone, fully push it against the wall spray it with soapy water, clean up any excess silicone, and we put these last couple pieces into position here. And then we have the adjustable bar for the handheld. So if you remember, we did install some blocking behind this to screw into. So we're just going to take some painter's tape, laser line, and kind of mark out the locations for where we have to screw this thing into. It's usually just two screws, one at the top, one at the bottom. And then it's just a quarter inch diamond bit for the grinder we drilled those holes with. We filled it with some silicone and then drove some four inch screws, wood screws, uh, through the handheld bar here, right into that wood blocking. For the mirror, we're gonna center it with the sink. So we're just gonna take some measurements off of that wall to the right there find the center of our sink, transfer that measurement onto the wall. And with this mirror, it's just two screw holes. So we're going to find out the location of those and then mark them accordingly on the wall. Height wise, typically you want your mirror center mirror to be about eye level, but really that depends on the type of mirror you're working. Um, another kind of thing you can play around with is the gap between the backsplash and the bottom of the mirror. You can keep that somewhere around four or six inches. Oftentimes looks nice, but a lot of this is going to be personal preference. We didn't catch a stud with ours, so we are just using these easy anchors. I like the nylon ones better than the metal ones. So we're just going to sink those into the wall and then drive a couple of screws in and just have those extended out maybe quarter to half an inch. That way the mirror, the two holes in the mirror can just rest on those screws and that's what's going to support this thing. And now that our mirror's in, we can drill out the holes for our octagon boxes. So on the right hand side there, we just kind of centered the box from the mirror edge to the wall and then transfer that same measurement over to the left hand side, reached into the cavity and pulled out the wires where we had left them in place. Then we can install our mounting boxes. So on the right, we're able to get a full size octagon box into that, which we just screwed into a stud, which was right there. And then on the left, we didn't land on a stud, which means we have to use a pancake box now. You really want to only ever have one cable in your pancake box. Um, 
and you should never do what we're doing here with two cables. However, in this case, the fixture that we had did give us a good amount of room to make connections in. So we were able to get away with this, but again, you really should only have one cable in a pancake box. And then here, just installing the fixtures, uh, again, just refer to your fixtures installation uh, instructions. They're all going to be a little bit different, but this one here, we just kind of connect our wires to the wires from the wall. And then it's just a couple of screws to mount this fixture into the bracket. It came with glass piece and a little bit of a led bulb to finish it off with. For our faucet, we want to get those hoses just right through that, that hole in the countertop. And then there's usually a gasket that you just want to make sure is in place on the bottom of this faucet. And then underneath you can go ahead and bolt it. Uh, usually it'll have a couple of things that will come down or maybe just one and you can kind of bolt it into position. Uh, for the drain here, this is a pop-up drain, which I would strongly recommend. And although these do come with those black sort of gaskets, which are supposed to prevent any leaking, I do like to just kind of add a secondary layer here of the silicone as I found uh, relying entirely on these black gaskets, just not to be completely reliable sometimes with these cheaper pop-up drains. Um, so here, just kind of foolproofing it, a um, little bit of a bead on both sides of that gasket. We're going to drop that into position. And then on the underside, you'll have three pieces that make up sort of the mechanism down here. So we want to get that black kind of gasket there up first, and then there'll be a little donut piece, either plastic or cardboard even, to separate the brass uh, nut there from the rubber, the black rubber piece. And we're just going to get a bead of silicone along the top of that. Once again, just extra insurance before locking this nut up into place. And this is going to, on the top end, start securing everything down. We want to clean up all that excess silicone. And you want to make sure not all of these uh, drains will have this sort of tailpiece that unscrews, but this one did. So we just want to hit it with some Teflon pipe dope and then screw it back into place. But again, not all of these will have this component here. And then we do just want to get the channel locks on there and just make sure that this, this nut here is fully snug and everything's tight. And then we can go ahead and connect this to the drain from the wall. So this is going to be a, just a couple pieces here. We're going to have this adapter piece, which converts from inch and a quarter to inch and a half. And that's going to go to a longer section of pipe down to our trap, which has a clean out built into it. And then that is going to have another piece of pipe that's going to connect the trap to the wall. And so we just want to do a dry fit here, as you can see, before we can go back and glue it all up. So here I'm going to start by just putting the uh, the drain adapter piece on there and then I'm going to connect the other straight piece of pipe to the 90 off of that trap, which I'm then going to put this piece in the wall because we know the dry fit was good. So we can just lock into place and have that 90 pointed straight down and we can get this uh, this other straight piece in the trap because again, there's no movement there. We did a dry fit and then that's it. We just kind of tighten all of the uh, the nuts here and it's going to be good to go. We replace the old outlet that was here for the entirety of the job now. So I'm just going to go and strip the leads uh, to be fresh and new and then tie in this new GFCI outlet. A lot of times they won't have a GFI outlet um, because it will be protected from a, a GFI located elsewhere. But in this case, we're just going to put a new one right here. That way, if it trips, you can reset it right at the source here absolute monster of a towel warmer going in so to line this up the way we we kind of configured this outlet down at the bottom right there is we test fitted this piece and chose the location for that outlet based off the stud so on the left hand side we're going to be able to fasten this bad boy into an actual stud and that's going to really help support it because it is so big and heavy we want to actually drill into actual framing here so we kind of just held that unit into place got it level and then marked the locations of the four mounting pegs and we can just screw the left two right into that stud and on the right two we're just going to use a couple of toggle bolts just to hold this right up against that drywall and again um, the majority of the weight in, in the unit itself will be just fine using the stud on the left hand side there and once we have these four pins locked in tightly we kind of hold it into the rough position here make the electrical connections and then get all these connections back into that device box screw the cover plate into position and then with the four mounting pegs it's just a little allen key that we can tighten to make sure that this thing doesn't come out of its position 
And although we didn't capture the footage on that job, here is from a previous project, you do want to seal your grout. So this is just some grout sealant in a little applicator tool. It comes with a little brush on the end. So you just want to run that over all of your grout lines and then wipe off any excess. And a reminder as to what we had before and what we made it into. So a few things we didn't quite capture in this video. The toilet installation as well as the glass installation. As far as the toilet goes, it's a pretty straightforward process. Uh, plenty of videos here on YouTube you can check out if you need some help with that. And for the glass, it is custom glass done by a third party. We prefer custom glass because it is a much higher quality product, but you can absolutely go to the store and get a kit and install it yourself. And again, plenty of videos on YouTube if you're interested in learning how to do that. With ours, you will notice the black bar at the bottom of the slider. That is because of the curbless application. It's just going to help maintain any of the water within the shower pan. And we opted to put that piece in, although it's not necessary. We do get our glasswork DFI coated, which is very similar to rain -X. It's just going to help the water just bead off of it, which leads to less maintenance. Although we still recommend having a squeegee in the shower to just reduce the overall amount you have to clean it. And if you're still watching, I assume you got some sort of value out of this video. You know, it is a long one. And if I could just maybe ask you to hit that like button on your way out, it would be very much appreciated. Thank you guys. And here are the totals, and this is the material cost only. This does not include taxes or labor, okay? If you're wondering, typically at this moment, we're currently pricing our labor at around 4500 Canadian a week. But that's just currently, and that's just my prices. That's not the contractor local to you, or even other contractors in my area. That's just my price. Anyways, thank you again for watching. Really appreciate it. And if you're watching this, I assume you have a project coming up, in which case I wish you the best of luck. Bathrooms are tricky. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. They incorporate a lot of different trades and require a lot of different skill sets. With that being said, it is something that you can do yourself. The first video on this channel is Baby Me doing a bathroom with no prior knowledge. And I made it happen. It was tough, and the work was nowhere near as good as what we can do now, but it worked out. And if you're thinking about taking this project underway, you're taking the right steps so far. Make sure you watch all the YouTube videos, every last one of them, mine and others, and... <laughs> Have a lot of patience. It's, it's a tricky beast, but it, it is one that you can do. Anyways, guys, thank you, and I hope you have a good day.